Oh, that's, that's cute. <laughs> it gets better. Uh, when I have to dog sit, he stays in my lab with me. Uh -huh. <laughs> sometimes sleeping like I would expect, and sometimes in a more comfortable <laughs> position. That's very cute. Yep, that's well, going to be a good dog, I can tell. Uh, he's a pretty nice guy. I yeah. like him. Yeah, <laughs> We need more nice in the world, that's for sure. Okay, well, thank you so much, and and thank you to everybody for tolerating the uh, the uh, diversion off to to cute dogs. Uh, as a as a former dog owner, many many times, I uh, have a very soft spot here. We don't have a dog right now, uh, but that's uh, not for lack of wanting. Okay, so so welcome everybody. Uh, this is October first. This is the best month of the year because it's the best holiday, uh, Halloween. And it has one of the most fun open source events, uh, which is Hacktoberfest. And Hacktoberfest is throughout the entire month of October. And it is uh, a really cool event with some some sponsors and some backing to it. And what you do is if you have a pull request uh, for repositories that are participating in Hacktoberfest, then you get points. You get some credit and you get some cool things some some rewards uh and you get to also contribute to open source uh so it's just a, a little incentive um and very fun so ORI's repos for the most part participate in in hacktoberfest all you need to do is add a tag to your repository so it's under topics under settings there's a little gear icon over to the on the right hand side of your of your repository page and if you don't have any topics already added to your repository, hey, this is a good chance to, to go in there and add some because it makes your repository more findable and categorizes it, gives it some, some additional metadata. And Hacktoberfest is one of those list tags. So looking forward to this. Uh, it'll be wonderful. Uh, it's, it's been been good for us every, every year. So that's, that's coming up uh, as a, a fun October thing. So what we do at this meeting is we talk about what we've done, what we have planned over the next little bit, usually a week, and if we have any challenges, like roadblocks in our way. So we talk about them, ask for help, and then uh, say, like, if we need any particular resources that the nonprofit can provide. And uh, so what I'll, and we do a roundtable approach to this. So I'm going to hand it off to, to Matthew, because we certainly do have a lot to talk about with respect to the Opulent Voice FPGA implementation. There's lots of, lots of good news and lots of plans there. Uh, so take it away. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I think we had some good progress this week um, in terms of getting, uh, you know, speed spectral output from the Pluto as well as, um, you know, I think, well, maybe we had it last week, but, you know, continuing to see um, the PRBS working the internal digital loopback, and we also yeah. have transmit streaming working now. So we've got a number of, um, hit a number of uh, milestones. Uh, so I think um, we've moved, we're moved, making really good progress. One thing we ran into in the last couple of days is when we saw the spectral output from the Pluto it was um, unexpectedly wide. So for a, a 54.2 kilobit per second data rate, we would have expected about, what was it? Like 150 kilohertz bandwidth, something like that. Um, but we were Three, seeing- more. It was like a 325. Yeah, that's what we were seeing. And we were, but we were, it should have been more like 150, right? Um, uh 81, about 81 kilohertz. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, it's 1.5 the bit rate, isn't it? Uh, yeah, that's right. So the null to null should be 1.5 the bit rate. So yeah, yeah, so about 80 uh, kilohertz, and it was more like 325 kilohertz. So I, I've dug back into the modem, and uh, clearly the F1 and F2 were way too wide, um, even though we were you know, successfully getting a good... Uh, continuous phase transition it wasn't minimum shift it was uh something more than minimum shift but still uh continuous phase um yeah it so, was medium we call it medium <laughs> shift king <laughs> yeah uh so we I've, I've dug back in and, and found the right uh f1 f2 that gives us the minimum shift there's just one uh one little thing that's left there's a i think a sign issue of some sort if i could just share this uh my screen for a moment. Was that all right? 
Yes, you should be able to. Okay. Um, so this is just the, um, you know, the current waveform, uh, you know, and in the simulation rather. And um, where did it go? Oh, it's going to come down here a little bit. There it is. So the, this this bottom signal here is the TX sample output, and and we could see a transition happen right here from F two to or F one to F two, um, and it's continuous phase like we want. But then if we move along, there was an example. Uh, sometimes the transition is it, the transition's in the right spot, but the sign is inverted, right? So the, this. As we uh, as we came from F two or F one to F two here, the um, the F two waveform should have been inverted such that it continued down. Uh, so we um, so there's a sign issue here, and then it happens again on this transition. Oh so yeah, that's really yeah, that's really clear. Yeah, that's a that's yeah. a good capture right there. Thanks. Um, yeah, so some of the transitions are are correct, like this one. And then some, um, we have a sign issue. So I'm just uh, going back through the Massey paper and seeing where my, where I, where I made the mistake. Um, so I think once I get this corrected, uh, we'll be back into well, at least the the modulation will be correct, and then I'll have to see if there's any um, any issues with the demodulation. Yeah, you know, presumably there shouldn't be because it was already working. I don't think the demodulator really cared about the how far apart f1 and f2 were so hopefully it just works but but we'll see maybe there might be something in the modulator that needs to be tweaked as well um, yeah that's that's right like demodulators for, for essentially like two you have two frequencies and you're doing frequency shift essentially like i think that i mean you can tolerate some phase discontinuity because and you get some loss but like you, sh you should still get the right answer it's just that minimum shift key and gives you the most efficient Right. coolest best answer yeah. so we're, you know we're it not... won't fail but but it, like it won't be it won't be ideal um but it'll still it'll still work even with with stuff like this right yeah well it's not currently because um i think because of the sign inversion so there's you know the the, the demodulator in this case has well the the f1 f2 coastal loops you know are fine they they are locking and look good but the the um the modulation per Massey isn't working because I think the sign issue on the tr on the modulator is um, tripping it up. Oh. So, um, because well, because the this the the modulator here has a uh, kind of a um, convolutional encoder per Massey, and so there there's a uh, the there's some oh, okay in, that makes that makes sense. The okay, encoder. So the decoder is probably not. Um, working right since the, the the encoder is there's something wrong here in the encoder okay wow so, thank you um but anyways i think you know we're back to something that's that's close uh or almost back to where we we wanted to be with the correct f1 f2 spacing so hopefully then you know once i get this fixed we can put it back on pluto and and see the spectral output that's the correct uh, null to null width that we're expecting. Um, and then, you know, I guess the other good thing or the other progress was uh, we did um, a, a, not just the digital loopback, but the RF loopback. And um, so Paul had some good results with that. We did see uh, some cases where we got zero, zero bit error rate. If, and depending on the um, attenuation in the RF loopback, we were taking a small number of bit errors um so we were close to threshold but when paul took out some of the attenuation um we, we went to zero bit errors so uh you know rf loopback is ostensibly demonstrated although i think there's some still some issues where uh with the spec with the rx invert um potentially because we're still getting bit errors maybe you can talk about that paul when you um when you're when you uh when, when you're when it's your turn so that we can I, I just um was wondering like in the graphs you presented why we're getting um the the 50 percent bit error rate sometimes versus other times where zero if there's some issue there that we need to resolve so anyways I think 
that's my status for this last week. So uh, as we move forward, um, I will fix the modulation and the demodulation if there's any issues there. Um, and then in terms of additional development, we want to put in, you know, based on what we went through in the last week, um, a simple power monitor, so like an I squared plus Q squared. Um, and then actually uh, using IQ output instead of real sim uh, sample outputs um, so that we get the image cancellation at the RF. And again, using IQ inputs in that, which allow us to compute I power V I squared plus Q squared. Um, and so that we can look at the power of the input samples. And then lastly would be, uh, or a couple other things that, that then still need some development is we want, might want to put a scrambler in at the, um, before the modulator and a descrambler afterwards. Um, and then the last thing would be, uh, that would be really nice to have is the, um, lock, uh, lock circuit for the two closest loops. Yeah. Wow. That's a lot. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is, this is all really, uh, it's really wonderful to hear. And, and these are some, some big ticket items uh, coming along and, and, and doing well. The, as far as the scrambler, um, we, we, so that since that's already in opulent voice, I think we can probably say that, yes, the, the, um, the data that's, that will be delivered will be will be scrambled, um, and, or whitened. Uh, and and for for people that are curious about this, uh, so so whitening is a technique that we do in digital communications in order to make the uh, to what we're sending look look random. And this really helps. So it's just a mathematical trick. Uh, so when we say that we're going to put in a scrambler, that's not a bad thing. It's not messing up the data. We're not doing anything harmful to it. We're, we're helping. Uh, and so we, we do have a, a scrambler specified in opulent voice protocol and, and we'll, we can, we can put that in. We can, we can actually, if we need to test it, we can take it out and, and use it uh, against the data. I, I don't know if that's premature optimization or, or not, um, but it's, it's there and specified. Yeah, I mean, I would have expected the PRBS to be random enough, but um, yeah, that's it true. Kind of the, like it, it, it should be. Um, I think Paul had a question with the because he, uh, I'll put in some some of these uh, graphs that we're talking about. So we graphed the the error rate with respect to the you know what we do in the C code that we're working with uh, is to run through all uh, some of the conditions. Uh, you know, we set the the modem up and then we run it through. Um, and then change things uh, by setting registers, and then we we take the the output of the loop back, and then we we graph it to see the error rate. And we're we're seeing some some really good things with respect to uh, the error rate. Uh, we're seeing some a lot of what we expect. Now, Matthew already brought up you know the after we uh, invert the receive, so there is a a, a sort of a, an aspect of this this particular modem where we have a 180 degree uh, phase ambiguity. And so in order to, to really figure out what you're getting, you may have to test you know, zero degrees and also 180 degrees. And this is this is actually a thing. This is a thing in digital communications. It's a thing in MSK. And there's, there's two ways to go about it. Either you test both cases and you pick the one with the much lower error rate, and that is the one that you need to go with that's not 180 degrees out of phase, or you, you do a differential decoder you add in a, a little circuit. And so I think we'll probably go with, eventually go with a differential decoder encoder to to take out this uh, phase ambiguity. But at this point with the circuitry that we have, we still have this in there. So when we walk through our, uh, you know, our operation of the modem, whether it's loop back, digital loop back, which means just through the FPGA, just through the device, or RF loopback, where it's actually going out over the air and it's cabled back into the Pluto, we see something kind of odd. What we're seeing is that once we uh, res you know, invert the receiver, so we invert our receiver bits, and then we invert them back. In some cases, when we invert them back, and in the case where the non-inverted uh, signal was the right one, it doesn't return there. It still has this really high error rate. So we're seeing it not quite 
<laughs> it's it's not getting it you know it's staying sticking remaining uh, in error and so so paul has some 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 charts that show this so we sh show it working and we show it not working as well so we have an intermittent failure with coming back out of receiver invert um when we're over the air when we're working just with the digital loop back it's just within the circuitry uh, of the fpga then um it works every time uh, and so it either works with inverted or not inverted and we insert an error and we deassert the error you know we have a a way to 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 put in errors manually, um, and so so that's kind of kind of where we're at with that. So it's a very interesting result. Uh, it could be uh, it, it could be simple. It could be pretty complicated. I say so, Paul. I think you're someone's sharing a screen, and if are you wanting to show graphs? And that that was gonna. And display the graph while you were talking about it. I couldn't tell whether it started to work or not. It looked like it wasn't working here. I see Zoom and I see a list of files. So I think you're sharing a window. Oh, there we go. Okay, so there's a graph. Okay. All right, you have the floor. Tell us what we're seeing. Okay, this is the visualization that we're talking about here. When we um, when we're running this test, we're we're taking a, a sample of. Uh, debug registers that Matthew added. Uh, one has the number of bits that have been transmitted, and the other one has the number of errors that have been detected by the, the PRBS monitor circuit. And I've graphed both of these here against the number of samples taken. So the bottom axis is arbitrary. Um, the black is the number of bits we're sending, and the red is the number of, of errors we're detecting. And you can see here that we're running multiple tests, each little um, continuous um, chunk of, of linear data is a separate test and they're just back to back. So we graph them all together. This is the last one we ran where we had uh, removed an extra 10 dB of attenuator and got more or less the expected perfect results or one of the two possible perfect results. Um, in this case, the 180 degree phase ambiguity was resolved in favor of the inverted uh, version. So if you look at the first triangle, you can see that the slope of the red curve is half the slope of the black curve. So that's a 50% error rate, which is what you'd expect if you're just decoding stuff that has nothing to do with what you expected. Random stuff. Um, and the same is true of the second. And in this third triangular shape thing, you can actually see if you look carefully that there are three different tests. There's a discontinuity around 81 or so and a, another one around 91. So these three tests all had the same 50% error rate results. And because of the way we invoked the test, we didn't have a, a reset, so it didn't jump back down to zero. And then the next tests, uh, the error rate is looks like zero on this graph. And in fact, it, it was exactly zero for this particular test run, although you can't tell from this graph. We also have test runs where the, it looks like zero on the graph and it was a small error rate, but the results are pretty much uh, the same interpretation. We have, we're able to sync and, and copy through the entire test uh, for several different iterations. And then around 142, you see a new slope. This slope is equal to the slope of the uh, of the transmit data. And that's 100% error rate, which is what you'd expect to get if you were in sync and locked with a data generator, but you had an inversion turned on. And that's exactly what, or turned off in this case, because it was on for the, for the part that was working. So this is exactly what you'd expect to see. And then the last segment there, we're back to... Uh, turning off the inverter, but we're still synced with the uh, the inverted data. And so we get back to the 50% error rate. So I made uh, about eight of these uh, for different test cases and we learned a lot from it. Uh, it's much easier to look at this graph than to uh, gro grovel through the data by hand and, and figure out what all those hex numbers mean. So this is what we were doing yesterday. Yeah, we did see the the final like when you come back from from inverting your data, you should see the opposite condition. If you were in a good good place, you inverted the data, you would mess it up, and then when you deassert that invert, you should get back to that good place. So we saw some missed handoffs there. Um, so that's on the list to try to track down um, and and clear it up. But in this case, it it worked as expected. It returned to the fifty percent error rate after the deassert of the invert. Uh, and like I said, 
uh, Matthew has plans to clean this up, to remove this 180 degree uh, phase ambiguity that exists because of the math. And uh, if, then we won't have to manually test and, or, you know, it, eventually they'll be automated, but we won't have to test both cases and then pick the, the best one. Um, so that's the that's the status on that. Yeah, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, you're using Datagraph to to take the results uh, from the C code. So we take the C code output. It's just printf statements that print the results of these registers that Matthew put in, and then turn it into a, a graph uh, using Datagraph. If I could find my screen sharing controls, which I've hidden under some other windows, yeah. I would uh, <laughs> I would show you what the Datagraph looks like. <laughs> I have only, um, I have only empathy. It's usually on the top in a little menu. I get too many other windows up and close some things. Maybe it'll reveal what's going on. Okay. And then go ahead and, and, uh, and work on that. And then we can, we can go to Aaron. So, so Aaron, you have the floor. Yes. So I've been out, I uh, was on a family vacation, it got back uh, last week, um, but I have been following through on my distraction. Um, so on, on the Pluto, I have a windower and an FFT implemented on the FPGA. Uh, my distraction is uh, being able to plot um, pi bandwidth uh, signal um, and take the log power FFT of it and display it. Um, and so I have that, those two components working on the FPGA and then it shoots it shoots the four 4096 spins uh, to the RC, to the CPU where it computes the log power and I'm and I have it on a single shot mode so you can you can take a in time you can just say I want that I want a, a snapshot of what's 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 out there in the spectrum um, so the next step that I'm going to be working on what I'm trying to do is trying to get towards to, to be able to demonstrate it uh, in a nice package um, and that's what I'll be working on this week. Uh, hopefully by next week, I could I could demonstrate it to everybody um, what it looks like. Um, I'm planning on using MQTT because Everest already has MQTT on the Pluto. Um, so it's going to shoot those samples out. And then there's this open source uh, spectrogram viewer on that you can use HTML5 to, to graph it out. So that's what I'll be working on. And then after I, I complete the demonstration, I'll, I'll return back to the MSK. Uh, it, it seems like there's been a lot of progress with it in the last week, and get that implemented as well, and see where it, where it's at on the on the open CPI side to, to help that out. Wow, fantastic! That sounds like a lot of good solid infrastructure that's coming along. Did did you have anything that you wanted to share, like screen share uh, today, uh, about that underpinning work? Uh, not not today. I I do not. Okay. I, I'll probably share some some graphs on this on Slack channel. But oh, basically, be, the way I have it wonderful. set, I have it set up where I have a frequency generator and then going to the receive side of the Pluto, and I've been able to test it um, in Open CPI. It, it is limited to thirty point seven two mega samples per second, and I was able to to, to test that that full bandwidth uh, to, to see that snapshot. Um, oh, the wow. idea is to to eventually, and in, in software, um, you can set the, the the frames per second. Um, and set that as a variable rate, um, so you, you can you can see it over time. Um, so you don't have to manually click it every time, basically. <laughs> right on. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's really exciting. Okay, so so next week, um, yeah, if you'd like to to demonstrate next week, uh, then we'll yeah. we'll make plenty of space, and that sounds that sounds super exciting. So looking forward yeah. to the the. Um, Anything that you can share on Slack, I think people will be very enthusiastic about. Yeah, and for, for people that are watching, like, could could you just briefly explain OpenCPI and the the benefits of of that uh, framework? <clears throat> oh yeah, so OpenCPI uh, tries. So one of the main benefits is is that um, in once you get an application working on one particular platform you can port that application onto various other platforms without having to uh, re-engineer uh, re um, to that particular platform's reference design. Um, so right now we're developing it on the Pluto, but in the future it can be moved on to the ZC-706 or the ZCU-102 
um, fairly easy because those are platforms that already support open CPI. Um, right now, the transceiver support in open CPI um, has a lot of support for the 809361. And then that, that, that support applies to the 9363, which the Pluto has, um, or the full, or which is a single channel transmit and receive. Um, but another thing that, that I want to, there's semi support for the 9371 that I want to bring out uh, and develop because um, that's another plot, that's another transceiver that uh, ORI uh, is interested in uh, using as well. Um, but the idea is, um, so the Zinc is a FPGA that has both the ARM uh, CPU and the FPGA fabric and the Zinc Ultra. Open CPI tries to to have like a, dri a Linux driver-like support of those devices so that once you come across them on another platform, um, for example, the Edis E310 uses the Zinc 7020, um, that you, you can port your application to those um, fairly easily or create support for that other platform um, easily since that's something that's already supported with an open CPI. Um, and that's kind of the, the idea that I have is, I mean, is that this will not only apply to opulent voice, but uh, maybe for the, the, the geostationary satellite um, that we're developing as well, um, where we can develop on using cheap and expensive hardware like the Pluto, and then take that uh, FPGA, the VHDL or the Verilog that we generated and be able to use it on, on the beefier, more expensive um, uh, development or the actual FPGA that, that we're gonna develop uh, PCB that's going to go off into space. Yeah, thank you. As a lot of us know, um, the the this effort and expense and and heartache in porting designs is is large, yeah. and and sometimes just that uh, perceived cost of moving to another um, architecture, another product, another uh, device uh, prevents a lot of of truly innovative work, and so. Uh, Frameworks like uh, OpenCPI that directly address this and understand uh, the value here um, are so worth it. So, so thank you, and uh, looking forward to seeing uh, some some good leverage uh, come out of this to to make the uh, you know the donated work and innovative work um, get a for essentially a force adder uh, that it re really helps. So, so thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, and and Paul, do you have a? You you have the floor if you if you're ready. Okay, uh, let's see if this works. Oh, very good. That looks okay. like Datagraph. So this is what Datagraph looks like. It's a Macintosh only application, so the rest of you guys can uh, can just wish you had <laughs> access to this cool. We can um, pound sand, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can. You can see that the raw data is there. I can probably use a, a pointer here if I knew what I was doing, but I don't, so it's okay. Um, on the left hand, there's a, a list of, of data columns and also formula columns and so forth, other sort of things you can have. And then your, the next thing over from left to right is the sort of a spreadsheet, which is all the raw data. It's in hex because that's how it was printed out from the, from the test program. And then on the right-hand side, the, the thing on the top with all the complicated little controls on it is the, the definition of the graph. And then on the bottom right is the, the current graph being shown. This is a, a different test case. You can see that in this case, um, the, the zero error section is in the middle instead of toward the right. That's where when it locked on without inversion. And this also shows an error, oddly, because that last segment between 150 or so and 160 uh, should be a zero error uh, test and is not. Right. So, that's that's the that's the thing that we're concerned about. That that once we invert the what, receive data, and then we go back to non-inverted data, we should see it go back to zero error. And since we're not seeing that, that's a clue that that there's something up, and we need to dig in. And it wouldn't be really obvious just looking at the the bunch of hex data. So the, the graphs are, are 
really illuminative. They, they help us out. Yeah. And there are similar graphing programs for, for other platforms, but I don't think any of them are as good as data graph. It's a really nice program. It is. Yeah. Thank you very much for, for producing them. Um, there's a, a number of different like articles and posts and things that we can share to kind of teach people about like what we're doing sh to let people in on, on how it's going. And, um, you know, I think these graphs will be, uh, will be part of that. So thanks very much for, for helping out there. Just another value added service from Remote Labs West. All right. So the big event uh, coming up uh, literally tomorrow is a digital update for microwave. So it's our, uh, it's essentially like a, a workshop. It's a retreat. It's a, a board level activity. It's a public activity. Uh, and it happens in Vancouver, British Columbia from the 2nd of October through the 10th of October. And we'll be publishing everything that we do and taking a mini lab with us. Uh, the topics include, but aren't limited to uh, all of the stuff that, that uh, ORI and AMSAT Canada submitted to uh, the MUD or Microwave Update Conference. And it all got kicked out. So we just said, okay, well, we'll go anyway. Uh, cause mud this year is in Vancouver and we'll, we'll just have a good time and see what we can do. And opulent voice is definitely on the list. So we'll be continuing the work that we're doing here in this, uh, in this meetup, uh, along with a, a bunch of other stuff. We've gotten some requests. Um, and yeah, it'll be good. Uh, after that, looking forward from there, uh, maybe some, some local events, uh, we'll continue our meetups, um, you know, but the, the biggest event for the year of us looks like it's it's DEF CON. So next year in the October, uh, in the August uh, time frame, so 2025, uh, August, will probably be our next really, really big uh, public event at a major conference. And if anything comes up between now and then, or if anybody listening to this has a suggestion for where they would like to see demonstrations or they would like to see our work, um, we're totally open to, to that. Uh, so looking forward to the next next meetup, which may be on the road uh, from from DUM and uh, looking forward to uh, the uh, the things that we we produce from from that particular uh, set of work. It'll be it'll be good. So thanks, everybody. Uh, Any last comments gonna, before we close? Are we going to try to have this meeting from DUM? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we'll we'll have it uh, have it on the road, and uh, it'll be it'll be fun. Hopefully, we'll have some some really neat things to to report and share. Uh, we will be taking like a mini lab with us and continuing the work that we talk about here. All right, so hey, uh, thank you very much. See you on Slack. Uh, that's where most of the day-to-day -day engineering and consultation collaboration happens. Uh, we also have a mailing list and a newsletter um, and a website with news items. And we are willing to, to take on projects. So if you have something that sounds similar to, to what we're, we're doing, or if you have a regulatory, uh, you know, goal in mind that you would like uh, for either open source digital radio or amateur radio, amateur radio service, either uh, satellite or terrestrial, and and you, you need some help. Uh, that's what we're here for. So so we're here to kind of push things along. Our next big regulatory thing is going to be about the 219 megahertz band. We're going to attempt to draft a proposed rule in order to kind of restore this band to a more sensible state for amateur radio and citizen science and education to make it accessible um, because the current rules are not working for the amateur service uh, and we have plenty of or help else. or anybody else really <laughs> amen to that so if that's a project that you're interested in in hearing more about we're we're doing that too so so hey join us at open research dot institute slash getting dash started and we're, we're here for you. Okay, until next week, see you soon.